very fine people, or how to stop worrying and talk about race, white nationalism, and Trump in America, a lighthearted romantic comedy from hell. Uh, or just a slice of 2018 that is having international long-lasting ramifications for both sides. Uh, since I'll be very diplomatic tonight, and this is a nonpartisan event, allow me to be very careful with my language when introducing myself and my guest. I wrote this down. I am a pre-partition Indian who is spiritual and religious, born to invaders, who did not come from a shithole country or a country on the travel ban, which means my parents are allegedly moderate and not rapists or criminals or MS-13. <laughs> But, wait for it, but they are radical Islamic terrorists, maybe, who did not come on caravans, but nonetheless did breed and infest this country with me, their only son, Wajahat Ali. Which is another way of saying I am an American son of Pakistani Muslim immigrants born and raised in the Bay Area, Fremontistan, California, whose parents gave me a tri-syllable name to blend in. Uh, I only spoke three words of English, the true story, when I was dropped off at Charles Hadaway Preschool. The three words were shut up, because my mother used to say shut up, true story. Idiot, because my mother used to say shut up, idiot. And for those of you who grew up in the 80s, you guys remember the SpaghettiO commercial, Oh Oh SpaghettiO? Yeah. So I used to say Oh Oh Pazgadio. Shut up, idiot, Oh Oh Pazgadio. Three words of English. I also wore husky pants. Anyone here with the trauma of husky pants? One, two, three, give me four, five, give me five in the back, in the back, six, seven, eight. I know there are fatties here, more fatties. Nine, 10, husky pants, 11. There you go, the guy grudgingly goes, too soon, man, too soon. There's, always, there's gonna be one person who comes up after who goes, I was also fat. Um, but I ended up graduating with an English major from UC Berkeley and marrying a varsity cheerleader who is super accomplished, super smart, and super hot, and somehow I got to Aspen, hashtag it gets better. <laughs> I'm joined to my left by a very well-spoken black man who does not dribble, but also does not shut up, which means he is not civil, but the jury remains whether or not he is a thug. But thankfully, we know he's not from Chicago, so he's not responsible for that urban violence. But he is for Black Lives Matters and against police brutality, which means he does not believe all lives matter, which means he is an anti-white racial segregationist who is always so angry, otherwise known as Johnny Cobb. Yeah. Um. Staff writer for an up-and-coming publication called The New Yorker. A startup. Yeah, yeah. A startup. Yeah, let's hopefully, hopefully it survives the digital age, the yeah. disruption. Right. Uh, professor at Columbia University, yes. uh, Graduate School of Journalism. This is the Columbia in, not from the sh shithole country, from the, the, yeah, yeah, the from West. The, right, right. The West. Um, mm -hmm. Author, pundit on TV, and proud dad of a very cute one-year-old baby. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Mm -hmm. If you are offended by that opening, this Brace yourselves, it's gonna be like this for the next hour. Uh, <laughs> some of you might be amused, but in the honor of our first lady, I don't care, do you? Um, too soon? No, no, I too think soon. right about on time. Nice. Yeah. So I thought I'd start subtle. Um, we're storytellers, we mm -hmm. tell and share stories. Human beings are the unique storytelling animals in existence. Mm -hmm. um, it's how we get to know one another, it's how we pass down our values, our traditions, our morals. Um, when you meet someone in America for the first time, you say, hey man, tell me your story. You and me might be the darkest things on this mountain right now. Yeah. Tell us we did, a We did a test. Yeah, yes, yeah, we right. did a test, a purity test. We came out dark. Um, <laughs> tell us a story for, for the crowd here. Walk us through your shoes. How's it like being Jelani, a large black man in your mm -hmm. large shoes who came to this mountain for the first time? Oh, yeah, I don't think I have a real good anecdote. I have, usually have a ton of anecdotes, but um, aside from always making sure I know where the exits are, I, mean, I think I'm pretty And that's good. an anecdote. Yeah, that's yeah. Anecdote. It's always like, oh, what do I do? In case I tell too much truth and I have to get out of here really quickly. But that's a fascinating point that you made that, and I've spoken to other minorities, people of color, that we always look for the exit signs. Mm -hmm. That we always want to see where the exit signs are. And, and also look for the other people of color. Yeah, you count them. Right, so you were you like them. me? Did you count them on the program? Oh, absolutely did. Okay. No, I counted them in the audience at the last event. Uh, do you, anyone, did anyone see Jelani at the last event? It was a... Mm -hmm. I was getting a little spicy. There was some masala there between him and David Brooks. It was getting tasty and then just killed it. We'll follow that up today, don't worry. Uh, but the fact that you counted the other minorities, and I did as well, mm -hmm. instinctually. Mm -hmm. The fact that when we were here in Aspen, everyone's been very nice and lovely. 
And Jelani and I joke that we will never be invited back again, so this is our go big or go home moment, <laughs> literally. Um, but what is it, most people don't do that. And why do you, do you feel like you have to self-police yourself to make yourself appear, and you already mentioned this, mm -hmm. civil and as palatable to society as possible? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's one of the things I think that's interesting about this conversation about civility, which is that there's a whole other layer of it. There's a whole other uh, internal dialogue where I'm conscious of the space I take up in a way that I think the average person is not, certainly not the average white person. I'm conscious of whether or not I've moved in a way that intimidates someone. Mm. I am conscious of when I'm in an elevator, if I'm in an elevator, especially if it's like a parking lot or whatever, uh, and there's a white woman in the elevator with me, I get out of the elevator first, even though it might be polite to let her out of the elevator first, but I know that she's probably worried that I'm behind her. Mm. And so it's like, let me not go through that. You self-police yourself. You, you're but, actually, you're overdosing on civility. But it actually is, it's actually another kind of thing because it's like a, a binary thing mm. because it's either all civility or all not. And so I try to err on the side of, I don't want to be in the position where you treat me like something other than what I am because then I'll respond to you in a way that like neither of us want. So does civility not require, and I think this is what you're getting at, uh, reciprocity? That's exactly the point. That's exactly the point. And so we've had this dialogue about you know, Maxine Waters. Uh, and I mean, it was absurd to me that people were concerned about what Maxine Waters said. Can you tell them what, they, what she said? Well, Maxine Waters said that people should be disruptive to uh, administration uh, officials uh, wherever they are um, because of what was going on. And we spent, you know, the Democrats you know, spent in the various members of the punditry uh, kind of rained down condemnation on her head. But I don't think. We are never in a position to make a moral argument when we have taken people's children away from them. Like, that's unconscionable to me. Some would say alien migrant babies. Right, that sounds like something from a sci-fi movie. Yeah. Um, would, you, would you pay a ticket to see alien migrant babies in tender baby care facilities? Um, no, but I'm sure Jeff Sessions probably would. Um, <laughs> And that's but, not a horror movie. That's happening right now in 2018 America. That's, that's and America. that's the language that's being used. I'm not being facetious. Right. And so, I mean, I'm looking at this and saying, like, you know, we have this refusal, which is entirely frustrating, this refusal to look at what the United States is capable of. Mm. And so when I heard John Kerry um, talk earlier this evening, which I thought he made a lot of great points, uh, but he said the United States has always erred on the side of freedom, always been on the side of freedom. I was like, that's not true. You're like, er? Like, Excuse me? What? Like, we, Scooby? We know what happened in the Cold War. Right. Do we need to run through the regimes that I think we supported? you need to. I really think, I mean, I, sometimes I feel like you need to connect the dots because people forget. But I think people forget that women didn't have the right to vote, that you need an amendment. Right. I think people forget that, you know, Japanese Americans who were citizens in this country were interned thanks to World War II based on the fears that were proved non existent uh, and then rationalized under national security. Right. I think right. people forget about slavery. Yeah, I think people, we certainly don't like to talk about that. Uh, and so we forget in 1882 that there was a circumstance in this country in which the, there was a groundswell of concern about an ethnic group that people thought were taking jobs and bringing drugs into the country. And that found its representation in the Chinese Exclusion Act right. in 1882. Or that in 1924, or really 1917, we could go back there, where there was this concern about the religious group that uh, people believed were aligned with America's enemies and needed to be surveilled, and they were, and needed to be uh, expelled from the country, and they were, and that they needed to be tougher immigration laws to prevent more of them from coming, and that passed in 1924, and they were talking about Jews. And this, of course, had disastrous consequences. And Irish, and Italians, and Eastern Europeans. Yeah, but particularly, particularly this, right, the scrutiny around Jews and saying that they were uh, susceptible to the allure of Bolshevism. Yeah. Um, and there was a narrative around it that you could almost replace Bolshevism with terrorism. And so I don't say that to actually tear the country down. Mm. I always say that to say we need to be clear of what we are capable of. And so we understand the parameters of the possibilities of this moment we're in right now. 
because we have an undue sense of calm that everything will work out. Uh, there's a kind of American exceptional optimism um, that I've always been kind of like, you can only maintain that by cooking the history books. Right. And erasing a lot of the protagonists who end up being the antagonists or just the footnotes. Right. Um, you made me jump the gun, but let's go there. Uh, I was having conversations 30 minutes ago in Hotel Jerome in the courtyard, mm -hmm. and there were um, people from a Muslim, uh, there was a person from a Muslim majority country, a scholar, and there was a European filmmaker trying to understand why so many Trump voters would vote against their interests. They were literally trying to understand why are they doing this? Don't they realize that China is ascending? A trade war is bad for you, and like you know, you're pulling back rights, and you know the healthcare. You need healthcare, and if you, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, they're doing the whole list. And I said everything you said logically makes sense, mm -hmm. but you're not American. If you're American, if you're a student of American history, and especially if you're a person of color, you can all of this makes sense from the lens of white supremacy. It does. And you mentioned the the heart, the good heart of America, mm -hmm. exceptionalism, merit. Anyone can come here. But what I might argue and disagree with me is that the dark heart of America that has never been confronted, never been dissected, never been treated, the root, the Voldemort, mm -hmm. is white supremacy that manifests mm -hmm. itself in every single example that you just cited. But I mean, but it's baked into like how the country was established. In the first immigration law in this country, you could only let white people come here. Or what's in the Constitution? Would we uh, defended the, the uh, transatlantic slave trade in the American Constitution? or in the Declaration of Independence where Jefferson first denounces the transatlantic slave trade and then copy edits out. And so it doesn't have any mention of this. And so these are things that we have to really talk about. But the other thing I think is interesting about the whole um, voting against their interests thing is that it's just that people define their interests very differently. I argued, I can I just say something? I pushed back and said, I believe they did vote for their interests. They did. And so here's, here's the analogy I use. And you know, sometimes I offend people with it. I hope not. You but offend people? Jelani Cup? No. I know. But here's, here, here it is. So if I'm an atheist and I see someone um, give their last $5 to the church collection, I'm going to say that's an irrational act, mm. that that's a ridiculous thing to do, and that you are acting against your interest. But to the believer, they're saying, you don't understand how I define my interests. What I've done with this contribution is purchase a sense of connection to a faith that's bigger than me, or uh, adhere to the principles of a doctrine that is much more important than being temporarily um, broke. Mm. And so if I understand my interests in these ways, you, we don't speak the same language. So I it would seem to be irrational and unreasonable to you. White supremacy operates like a faith in this country. And people are willing to tithe in particular ways. That if I'm going to give up my health care, if I'm going to give up uh, any kind of rational uh, immigration policy, if I'm going to turn over authority to an authoritarian figure who seems hostile to the very concepts of democracy, I'm purchasing something else with that. What are they and purchasing? that is my sense of superiority. Um, and so that is how we have looked at this. And if we don't understand that language, that behavior would appear to be inscrutable. And now it sounds like doctrinal and like maybe I'm a far left radical or whatever, except going back to the David Brooks conversation, when we start looking at, and this is like study after study after study. The last two this, years. Right. Has shown time and time again that it wasn't an economic impulse that drove people to Trump. That it was a much more um, clearly antagonistic uh, ethnic anxiety that drove people to yeah. Trump. And so what are we supposed to do with that? Unless we're willing to look at it, we don't have any hope of actually addressing what we're dealing with. And I have to give myself standing, lest I appear to be an angry, radical, leftist, irrational, brown-skinned, Muslim rage boy. Um, I went and talked to Trump supporters. I was the only person of color and the only journalist at a main Trump rally two weeks before the election, mm -hmm. right after Grab Him By The Pussy came out. Mm -hmm. uh, I spent nine hours talking to them. I talked to white Democrat Bernie supporters and white Trump supporters in DNC in Philadelphia. I spent time, I looked at the studies. Mm -hmm. I kept telling people, take Trump literally and seriously. I said he is appealing to white anxiety and fear. 
he's selling them a nostalgia to feel great again, mm -hmm. but that feeling of greatness will come at the expense of millions of fellow Americans. I said the Muslim ban will happen. I did a segment for Huffington Post, which was tongue in cheek, I'm going around Philadelphia asking people, will you visit me in the Muslim camps? Uh, you can laugh now, maybe. <laughs> and they said, ha, ha, ha. And then I said, can you make sure there's at least Wi-Fi and tell me who wins at the ga end of Game of Thrones? Um, and they did, they, even the white liberal progressive supporters mm -hmm. said, that's not our interest. We care more about TPP who won't do it. Don't take him literally and seriously. And then I saw again and again and again when I talked to people that he gave them a sense of nostalgia. Mm -hmm. And if you look at all the studies, and David Brooks mentioned this, but he didn't mention the second thing, well, white people voted for Obama, but... Like what? five people. No, 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 no. White people <laughs> right. voted for Obama. Studies, because everyone loves studies and stats and science in Aspen, I realized. So I have to ground everything in that to prove my standing. Um, and I did the work, and you did too. The two reasons why white voters switched for Trump. Anyone know why? Take a guess. Immigration, national security of the Muslim threat. Mm -hmm. The first 30 second ad that was dropped by the Trump administration, you can see it on YouTube, focused on only two issues. Anyone take a guess? Immigration, Muslim ban. And they showed a photo, a video of all these brown people running, but they weren't Mexicans, they were Moroccans, but whatever, brown, mm. um, and, and the Muslim ban. And then we just dropped the Muslim ban yesterday in a 5-4 vote, right. where if I may make some commentary, I do not blame Gorsuch, because Gorsuch was gonna vote that way anyway. Mm. I predicted that this would be the ruling that would haunt the legacy of Anthony Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And he decided to go out on that and several other rulings as well. And I wanna make it personal now, because my you were talking earlier today, mm -hmm. and right before your David Brooks comment, the, the, the other panel, my wife called me. Happy wife, happy life. I left the tent, talked to my wife. My wife is born and raised in Okeechobee, Florida. Grew up with Trump supporting whites. Did the rodeos, is addicted to sweet tea is of South Asian descent. White people love my wife. If you don't love my wife, something's wrong with you. My wife, for the first time ever, on the phone as we were just talking to each other, she said the following, and it didn't hit me until I thought about this. Mm -hmm. Did we do the right thing having kids in this country? Mm. My babies are four and two. Yeah. Did, did, how did we fail our children? I'm getting a little bit choked up, I never mm -hmm. do. How will we protect our babies? Mm -hmm. What are we gonna do? My wife is not an emotional reactionary person. So what do I tell my babies? Mm -hmm. And what do I tell Muslims when I represent America abroad for the State Department, for American diplomacy? Mm -hmm. And I say, ISIS is wrong. Anyone can come to America regardless of their gender, ethnicity, and skin color. And you know what? We can make it. They don't hate us. Mm -hmm. The Muslim ban drops. What do I tell my kids? And what do I tell Muslims abroad? Right. And that's always been the question. That's the question that confronted Louis Armstrong in, uh, in the midst of the Little Rock crisis where the United States State Department wanted to send him abroad to play jazz as a cultural ambassador. And he's saying, look at what's happening in, in Arkansas. I can't do that. Uh, and so there is a kind of international logic to protecting human rights at home. And it's not that complicated. And so I think I had a conversation, I won't say with whom, but um, I had a conversation earlier. Tell us, tell uh, us. I won't, I won't put them on the spot. But, um, this but is off the record. It's just being videotaped. Follow me on Twitter, if you follow me on Twitter, you already know who it was. But yeah, yeah, no. um, I had a conversation with this person about the, the tenor of concern. And I said, I have to tell you that I view the world from a very particular perspective. Um, and that is the perspective of uh, the son of a man who had a third grade education, grew up in uh, Jim Crow, Georgia was not allowed to go any further in school, and his son has a doctorate degree. And largely as a testament to the incredible diligence of my parents. Mm. And so mm. the thing that my father told me, though, was to never be too comfortable yeah. when he told me about the South. And when he warned me about the kinds of horrors he saw, I listened. And it would be derelict to me as a writer and as a son to not say that I'm seeing things that seem disturbingly similar to the things my father told me about. And so that's what motivates me to say that we have to talk about this and look at this with a particular degree of urgency. And there's one other thing, there's one other point that I usually bring up when I, this topic comes up, which is that um, <clears throat> Trump is from Queens, 
I'm also from Queens. Uh, Donald Trump is from Jamaica Estates. Uh, I am from South Jamaica. Those two communities have exactly the relationship that their names would imply. Mm. <laughs> and so Jamaica <laughs> Estates is up on a hill in upper income uh, households, mostly white. Uh, South Jamaica, working class, uh, blacks, and mostly Puerto Ricans, some Dominicans, um, and, and at the bottom of the hill. And there was a curious kind of seeming contradiction that Queens exists as the, statistically, the most diverse county in the United States. The most. Uh, and you know, we would jokingly say that it was impossible to be racist in um, Queens because you didn't even know where people were from. You couldn't assign the right stereotype to them. You're like, I'm sorry, where are you from? Like, why don't we like your people? Like, what is it? But, um, sorry, that's funny. Black people uh, laugh yeah, at that. But, <laughs> but, but that was the Queens that I grew up in. Yeah. Um, the, I played baseball in high school. The uh, left fielder was South Asian. Yes. Um, right. The one time we made <laughs> it. Spelling bees? We just kill it at spelling bees, man. So <laughs> right. you just gave me hope no, for my no, child. No. Just give us something. All right. That's my all man, we got. My man was left fielder. I was a right fielder. Oh, uh, tier of pride. Yeah, I was right fielder. Um, center fielder was Puerto Rican. Uh, first baseman was Jamaican. Uh, second baseman was Jewish. You just described the American dream or the American nightmare, depending oh, yeah. on who's listening. Right, but we sucked. That's the other thing. Like, you know, we weren't, we weren't Thank good. you for that, Jelani. I yeah. just teed you up but, so but, well. But we had, we had like this United Nations kind of thing when we came out United onto the colors field. colors of Benetton. Right, exactly. We just didn't do well once we <laughs> got there. Um, but the, the thing about it that was striking to me was that the primary nativist voice in modern American politics is a product of the most diverse community in the United States. You know who is the most anti-immigrant state in America? What? West Virginia. You know wow. what state has the least amount of uh, immigrants? West, West Virginia. Virginia. Uh, I wanna, I thank you for personalizing this, mm -hmm. and I joke with people when they say, oh, Waj, you're being a little too, uh, you're, just, you're being like, you know, you're just being negative Nancy, talking about authoritarianism, and I'm, I tell people, like, I'm collecting Russian Jews, like Yasha Monk, Julia mm -hmm. Ayafi, uh, Masha Gessen, who've been uh -huh. talking about this, who've actually lived through authoritarianism. Right. And I'm like, listen, America really loves Russians right now. Maybe you can tell them. Right. Uh, and so speaking about white supremacy and Trumpism and white nationalism, the best messenger for that who has experienced it from the beginning, I think, is a black American male. And so let's talk about civility. I want to give you some, just some things that have been happening. Mm -hmm. Police were called because a girl was selling lemonade. Mm -hmm. Police were called because two young men were waiting for a friend at Starbucks. Police were called because a Yale student was sleeping on the couch in a dorm in the university she attends. Police were called because three friends were vacating a house they rented in a suburb uh, on Airbnb. The one constant among all of them, anyone take a guess? Black. Black. Let's talk about civility. What is the civil way for an unarmed black person to not be shot and killed by the police? What is the civil way to protest brutality against your bodies when we know America in 2018 won't tolerate black athletes kneeling peacefully mm -hmm. during the national anthem? Right, I, mean, I think that that's the point, that you can't protest in ways that people find intimidating, you can't protest in ways that people find uh, that are peaceful. And what it is is that people don't want to hear what you have to say. And so I don't think, I mean, it's not normal. It should not be normal that I know what it's like to have, I've never committed a crime. Um, this is a bizarre thing to say in Colorado. I've never used any drug. I'm like the only person in the room that's never done weed. I, um, I accidentally did weed once. Really? In Nepal. He, he, the guy gave Jesus, it to me. Jesus, in Nepal? Yeah, he said, it's friendship cigarette, friendship. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, all right, calm down. And I took it. I took two puffs. And I'm like, this doesn't taste like a cigarette. What's in it? He goes, ganja. <laughs> so I'm admitting as a teetotaling Muslim that I once accidentally inhaled. But right. you haven't. You're even better than me. I've, I've never You I've make never a better done, Muslim. But I have, I have had police officers pull guns on me twice. Yes, you have. Something that probably most white people have not had, of, had as an experience. Why? And so the well, first, mean, wh why did they do that? Yeah. The first time, the first time um, this happened was I was a teenager and there were a group of us uh, walking on the curb in Queens, like not a, on the sidewalk, but on the curb. 
And the officer pulled up and took his gun and told us to get the F on the sidewalk. Um, and another point happened, uh, this is in Washington, D.C., uh, where we <laughs> were running up to a police officer trying to tell him that we had been robbed, and the police officer pulled his gun, I guess, thinking we were about to do something to him. Wow. Um, but those realities are kind of, unless you believe, unless there's credibility, yeah. where people are saying, this is actually what our experience is, mm. then it's easy to just dismiss. And I think on the other side of it, we're all inclined to want to believe that our team is the good team. And I still think that America is fundamentally yeah. good. I don't think that America is fundamentally perfect. And that's where the big division is. And that I'm saying that we have to look at the imperfections for our own collective sake, almost as like the kind of siren in the night. And, and you said things which I want to touch on, that you are a staff writer for The New Yorker. Mm -hmm. You are a professor, prestigious professor at Columbia University. Mm -hmm. You are at Aspen Ideas. Mm -hmm. You are in the Netflix documentary, 13. Mm -hmm. You are creme de la creme. You mm -hmm. have achieved it. And yet you told me, in this audience, the first thing you looked at was the exit sign. <laughs> right. I mean, I was being a little facetious. No, no, but right, like, but you know, but, but you weren't facetious, but you know, right. you're kind of facetious, but you did, but you mentioned it, right? But and not so, entirely, right. Yeah, yeah, and so take me, if you can, you see black football players peacefully, quietly taking a knee mm -hmm. to protest not the flag, not the military, because they've articulated that mm -hmm. again and again, to protest police brutality against innocent black bodies, and yet a large part of white America says, that is offensive to me. Mm -hmm. So sing, sitting here in 2018 Black America, how do you just keep yourself from being enraged and nihilistic? Mm -hmm. I think the nihilism is a bigger struggle. Like there's always, I think, a subcurrent. Like James Baldwin said, to be um, black and relatively conscious is to be yeah. in a constant state of rage. Yeah. But I think that there's also the nihilism, which is the thing that um, I think is a bigger, more daunting challenge. And so I think about this, because I'm a historian, um, in addition to being a journalist, I think about this in the kind of long sweep that for the people who audaciously wrote themselves into the narrative of this country, uh, who... That's very diplomatic language. No, I mean, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. Like, yeah. for people who insisted that their presence would be recognized and respected in some way, shape, or form, they had less basis for optimism than I do. And so I don't think that I have the right to be pessimistic, that I haven't earned, I haven't suffered nearly enough to warrant pessimism when I think about the odds that other people faced and the, other, the odds that other people are willing to confront. Can I say as a, as a South Asian Pakistani immigrant, um, as a Muslim, uh, and they're black Muslims, right? We know that 20% mm -hmm. of American Muslims are black Muslims. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I look at the history of what black Americans have gone through, Latinos, Japanese Americans, women, and I say it has been so much worse that I cannot afford to be nihilistic as well. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I say to myself is I've had a good life, and I'm not trying to be nihilistic here, but I have babies. Mm -hmm. And my babies deserve a better future where they can be the protagonist of the American narrative. Right. And then I also think to myself is in my religious faith, there's a beautiful saying, there's a hadith, a saying of the Prophet Muhammad that says, uh, and Jewish tradition has this as well, uh, even if you see the day of judgment coming around the corner, plant a seed. Mm -hmm. In Jewish tradition, I says I think it's uh, the tree. And for many of us, people of color and women, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse was a yellow-haired, uh, thin-skinned Cheeto with tiny fingers, mm -hmm. uh, surrounded by Jeff Sessions, uh, Steve Bannon, Stephen Miller. And we told people to take him literally mm -hmm. and seriously, and no one li listened to mm -hmm. us. The only time I get a little bit of rage, I'm actually a very calm person is I think back in the last three years, and we said, we told you. Mm -hmm. And I think about black people, I'm like, shit, black people have been telling us for 150 years. Well, they told us. And then I see, then I see, I didn't want to interrupt you, but then I see summer, Charlottesville, mm -hmm. young white men with mm -hmm. nice haircuts who shop at Old Navy and Banana Republic, mm -hmm. who bought a Tiki Torch set at uh, Walmart or Home Depot, mm -hmm. chanted Blood and Soil, mm -hmm and said, the Jews will not replace us. Mm -hmm. One of them decides to get into a car, right. a Hitler sympathizer, uh, a member of the alt-right, a uh, sympathizer of KKK, deliberately drives his car through a crowd, killing a young white anti-racist protester, a white woman, 
Heather Heyer. Donald Trump, who's not at a loss of words or tweets for anything, spends a little bit of time and then blames both sides right. and says there were some very fine people. On but people side. forget yeah. he also then does the following. He retweets fake news about uh -huh. Chicago violence. He also then does a pardon of Sheriff Joe Arpaio, mm -hmm. one of the most, ra the most racist sheriffs who broke the law uh, and is detested by anyone who cares about human rights. Your response. Well, you know what's interesting about that is that they were chanting, alternately chanting, Jews will not replace us and you will not replace us. And I remember sitting at home watching this on TV going like, I wrote a long piece about the origins of Black Lives Matter. Uh, I spent a lot of time, in, a lot of time interviewing uh, activist types, progressive, left-leaning people. Never has anyone come up to me and said, Psst, keep it to yourself. We're going to replace the white people. <laughs> Pass it on, you know? Um, it's just it's not- a, We send a pigeon, we send a pigeon, right. yeah. <laughs> right. We don't trust social media anymore. But it's like- uh, I'm just kidding, we don't send a pigeon. This was, this was no, on nowhere on anyone's agenda. And you know, I got an email once, which is typically I, I, I ignore these emails, but I actually got into an exchange with this person. And he was talking about um, the concern over immigration. He wrote me, I wrote something uh, for the New Yorker, and he wrote an email that was very much of like the kind of alt-right inclination. Yeah. And he said, admit it, you'd be just as alarmed as I am if the people pouring into this country were white. And I was like, oh, you think I'm the mirror image of you? Right. And I was like, no, actually, I wouldn't. Right. It was like, your struggle is to maintain a particular hierarchy. Right. And you think that I want to reverse the hierarchy. Right. No, I want to abolish hierarchy. Right. You want an equal playing I want, field. I want equality. Right. You don't want double standards, we want equal standards. Right, exactly. It was like, and so we're fundamentally at odds about this. It's like projecting your own motives into other people's actions. And speaking about the studies that have been done by Trump supporters uh, and the ones who voted for him, it's, the psychology is fascinating because for many of them, it's been a zero-sum game. Right. Absolutism. Jelani and Wajahat sitting at Aspen at this table means that my children cannot sit at this table. Right. We took their seat. Whereas you and me, and I'm gonna make an assumption, we say, holy crap, we got to Aspen. Right. <laughs> We're at the seat, we're eating salmon, keep right. quiet. Uh, <laughs> they probably think I'm Fareed. <laughs> yes, you know. Uh, thank you, thank you for watching GPS, thank you. Uh, and growing up, you know, growing up in elementary school, mm -hmm. When the white kids invited us, the, all the minority kids, it's like when you, go to, when, you, when you go to preschool, that's when you know you're different. Because you go to preschool and you're like, what, you don't eat with your hands? What, you don't have a trisyllable name? What, you speak English? What's that? Uh, and then you find the Latino and the African American, mm -hmm. and you make like the ethnic Avengers. <laughs> um, and then we always wanted to get invited to Chad's party. Mm -hmm. We wanted Brett mm -hmm. and Chad to like us. Mm -hmm. We wanted Veronica to like look at us the way mm -hmm. she looked at Chad and Brett. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I just want to echo that. It's like, we just want a seat at the table. We don't want your table. Right. We just want to bring a chair to the table and ex eat this thing you, call, you eat called meatloaf, which sounds fascinating, <laughs> you know? But it's also, I mean, I also think there's another dynamic to this, which is that when people were talking about economic anxiety, I was like, to the extent that that holds any um, validity, it's not that people are concerned about their economic status. Mm. They're concerned about their economic status relative to people who don't look like them. There you go. And that is like the crucial element of it. Because the critical element of it. it the, the critical element of it is- Because it's measured by it. All the, di all the disruptive dynamics of globalism, of which there is a valid critique to be made, all those disruptive dynamics were present before Obama. Yeah. But it was the presence of this African American in the White House that sent people into this relative concern about right. their status. Right and saying that weird statistical um, 
trend that popped up in, I think, 2011, and then just continued to accelerate over the course of uh, Obama's presidency, which was the number of white people who felt that white people were the most disadvantaged group in American 51 society. 51% yeah. according to the NPR poll that came out two months ago. 51% yeah. of white Americans feel they're the most disenfranchised minority in America. And so the thing is, you know, that is, there's no indicator or index that supports that. Everything from life expectancy, uh, lifetime uh, earnings, uh, likelihood of being arrested, likelihood of invites being invites to Aspen of murder, Ideas Festival, invites to Aspen Ideas too Festival, soon. right? Too soon. All those I'm things. I'm never going to get invited again. I know. I mean, all, the, all those all those kinds of dynamics yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, favor white people. Yeah. Even when we look at the kind of uh, decline that the opioid crisis has has ushered in, um, with white life expectancy it still is longer than like the middle class black people are trying to get to or the Rust Belt. lower income white people life expectancy. Or, or the Rust Belt. Right. You know, the anxiety of the Rust Belt, which is very real, look at Latinos and African Americans in that same economic pool and they have it much worse than their white neighbors. But also, but no like one talked about, the thing is no one talked about that. Like when they said, oh, the Rust Belt anxiety, which I want people to care about because I believe, and maybe I may, might be audacious and crazy, that we should be empathetic people who care about all Americans and all citizens mm -hmm. and even the undocumented, uh, regardless of their skin color or gender or ethnicity or national origin, there were black and Latinos in the Rust Belt who have suffered and no one talks about the black hillbilly elegy mm -hmm. or no. the Latino hillbilly elegy. But, or, or even the idea, why do we even allow the formulation of white working class? Like why was white relevant to it? Why? Like, what was, what was the point of that? Unless we were talking about, uh, oh, it's particularly bad if these people have been excluded from the American dream. Um, and so in that 51%, uh, which kind of started in 2011 and then grew and grew, uh, that was an emotional reality, a salient emotional reality, even as it wasn't connected to any actual empirical reality. Mm. And we're seeing what the implications of that were now. Uh, we have 20 minutes, and I'm gonna ask five questions in 20 minutes, maybe six, we'll get through everything. Uh, and we'll do Q&A also somehow, maybe. Um, you talked about Obama and how Obama, to many of us, was, when he got elected, I remember I told my friends, wait for the backlash. Mm -hmm. And I was told by many of my very well-intentioned, very well-intentioned white friends, this is proof we live in a post-racial America. We yep. flew over it. Keep your pin in that for a second about pin the post-racial. Can I just say what irritated me about the post-racial America thing? That in, in 2008, 42% of white people voted for Barack Obama. So he won the minority, he did not win the majority yeah. of white voters. And on the basis of this, people were going like, oh my God, we're post-racial. 42% uh, of white people have voted for a presidential candidate that doesn't share their racial background. Or in short, 42% of white people did what 100% of black people had been doing since the 15th Amendment allowed us to vote in the first place. Latinos, but, Asian but, Americans. But nobody came up and yeah. said, those Asian Americans are so post-racial. Right, uh, th those black Americans are so post they, they didn't hold LBJ's race against them. Yeah. You know, they just and, and went into the poll and, and voted and for And him. to prove that you just don't vote by race, uh, did you vote for Herman Cain? Uh, no. Alan Keyes? Um, no. Uh, ben Carson, uh, who will toss the fruit salad of your life. Uh, Remember that quote? I love that quote. I, I did not. You did not? I did not vote for Ben Carson. Fascinating. It's amazing. Who would have thought? Yeah. So we live in this post-racial America. Uh, and let's not forget that President Obama was portrayed on the cover of New York Post as a dead ape shot by police. People forget That's right. that. That's right, yeah. I keep receipts. The cartoons, right. Uh, but I was told by a very well-intentioned big foundation that a funder in Boston wants to talk about racism in America, a white funder, well-intentioned, does not want to talk about Black Lives Matters, <laughs> refuses to fund it if they talk about Black Lives Matters, sees it as too uh, disruptive. He just wants to talk about reconciliation. Response. Okay. Yeah, we can't really do that because it's the actual... <laughs> I th aren't you missing truth? Because right, South like, Africa had truth, right, and, truth reconciliation. and reconciliation. Like, let's just go to right, let's just let's take the Delorean to because reconciliation. There's always there's always this desire to just be done with race. Yeah. I guarantee you that nobody wants to be done with race more than black people. <laughs> like, guarantee you that. Yeah. Um, but we also are looking at the the hard emotional, st st statistical, economic realities yeah. that correlate with skin color, and so 
there's something that we have to confront that is optional for white people to confront. Yeah. And but my favorite story about this is that I was talking with a good friend of mine who does international reconciliation work. And he lives in Boston. And when that incident happened where they were throwing around epithets in, um, in uh, was it, not Wrigley Field, uh, oh, oh, uh, Fenway, in Fenway Park, yeah. when they were throwing around racial epithets uh, at, uh, I forget which player it was, and Boston had this kind of reckoning with racism there. And he said to me, he, and this is like someone who does international conflict resolution work, he said to me, I had no idea Boston had a reputation for racism. Yeah, ask and, people who live there. And, and I, right, I said, I said, what? Yeah. I said, man, you guys are like the New York Yankees of racism. Yeah. And he was like, what do you mean? I was like, not always the best, but always in contention yeah. to be the best. Always top three. <laughs> right. Always top three. Always, always in the hunt, yeah. right? It was like, it's like you in Mississippi, like, you know, perennially, yeah. you really, remember like in school where people said you had to apply yourself? Like, just you'll, you can do better, just apply yourself. Like, you really had to apply yourself. Yeah to elbow out Mississippi. You, you, had to, you had to have a lot of merit. Right, you had a lot, a lot, a lot of merit. Um, and so this too is a conversation soon, that someone who does this work yeah. didn't know was yeah. happening in the city yeah. where he lived. And that's a lot of folks. You know, a lot of folks don't connect the dots. Mm -hmm. And I found out that when you talk to people, there's well-intentioned people, you literally have to connect the dots. Right. And I have to remind people, I'm like, who did America choose to represent this country in the 1996 Olympics to hold the flame? They're mm -hmm. like, who? I'm like, Muhammad Ali, mm -hmm. you can't get a more Muslimy name than Muhammad Ali. You can't be more of a Muslim icon than Muhammad Ali. You cannot be more black mm -hmm. of a black icon than Muhammad Ali. You cannot be more of an American international face mm -hmm. of, of our country, our values, and sports than Muhammad Ali. And you know what people say? Oh, yeah, forgot that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. He is a Muslim. Ah, huh. he was one of the good ones. Um, right. Here's a, here's a weird little historical detail, which is that uh, you mentioned that 20% of American Muslims uh, in, are black. Uh, what most people don't know is that that's not a modern development, that many of us came here during slavery. Five to 15%. Right, we're Muslim, we're Muslim. right. A significant population of, of African, Africans who were brought here in slavery were Muslim. Five to 15% of the slave trade that was brought here forcibly, forcible immigration ac across the Atlantic were black Muslims. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm glad you mentioned that and, and you highlighted it is if you think about it and you think about stories, black Muslim sweat, mm -hmm. labor, and blood, and narratives, and hopes, and dreams have fertilized this country's soil mm -hmm. from the beginning, mm -hmm. 400 years. So when people say, who are you? You're not American. What do you tell us as Muslims and black folks mm -hmm. whose bones are buried in the ground? Yeah, exactly. Sorry about that. That was my little rant. Uh, three more questions, if I can. I, I cannot forget. Thank you for that one golf clap. Uh, <laughs> your check is in the mail, or for your millennial, I'll Venmo you. Um, I can't ignore my Latino, Latina brothers and sisters. I want to talk about language. Mm -hmm. in La Latina accent. You were gonna say, I was just waiting for you. I, I prompted you. Come on, have some faith in me. I want to talk about language in relation to immigration. Mm -hmm. Tender care facilities. Summer camps, right. according to Laura Ingram. Children are uh, not children or babies, but alien migrant kids mm -hmm. or, quote, child actors, mm -hmm. according to Ann Coulter. Invaders, mm -hmm. infestation, Infest, right. rapists, mm -hmm. criminals, caravans of terrorists, MS-13. Mm -hmm. You deal with language, you deal with words. How has language and image, or how does language and image how is it used and abused to convince so many Americans of goodwill mm -hmm. who are so empathetic, who fear God, who read the Old and New Testament, mm -hmm. who read Matthew, that it's okay to separate kids from their, uh, mm -hmm. at, from their parents at the border? You know, um, there's an even kind of better direct reference, which is that Jason Stanley, who was a uh, really wonderful scholar of uh, philosophy at Yale, has a book that comes out next month called How Fascism Works. And his, and his other book that came out three years ago is How, how uh, Propaganda which Works. Which I recommend everyone right. reading. But both, actually, both of them are great. But, uh, and How Fascism Works, and it's, the book is like 130 pages, maybe. Uh, but he talks about that use of language that separates you from the humanity of the other person that you're dealing with. Uh, and it's not 
uncommon, it's not coincidental that, you know, in Rwanda, you know, people began referring uh, to the Tutsi as cockroaches, right. to find you know, vermin, things that you are not... Um, rats. Rats. Rodents. Also, how often people preface, is meant to conjure disgust, how often a racial or ethnic or religious epithet is preceded by the word dirty. Like of all the adjectives you could use, it's specifically dirty. And so it's meant to create the kind of revulsion that allows us to carry out atrocities. And I think that when we look at this and say, there are nine-month-old babies that are separated from their parents. If you don't, if you don't want to see it, hear it. ProPublica did a seven-minute audio right. recording. I and recommend it's un everyone It's unconscionable. Hear it. And we say, where does this lead us? And the other thing I think about this is, is, is this. As someone who um, has taught a great deal of you know, the history of race in this country, when we look at the history of lynching, for instance, most of these incidents started from just the most minor slight, yeah. the most, like in Oklahoma. Emmett Till. Emmett Till, right. In Oklahoma, um, where there's the uh, Tulsa riot, where some untold number of, of black people were killed, estimated at least 300, the provocation there was simply that there was a black man in an elevator with a white woman. Yeah. That was it. And that was where this, this spark began. I feel like we have this kindling in this country that we have ginned up this animosity to such a degree that what frightens me is that there's only a little provocation that's needed. That One terror attack. <laughs> no, I think. No, I'm just saying, right. but, but you, uh, that's the extreme version for, yeah. but you're just saying even a small, like uh, Emmett Till I mean, was a teenager I mean, who whistled at a white woman. Who whistled woman. at a white woman. But I think this dude, who the dude who is uh, Muslim or, or Muslim looking. You know, Muslim me, we call it Muslim me. Right, like the people in Kansas that were shot because the guy thought that they were. Um, Indian Hindus. Indian Hindus, but they were from, uh, were they Iranian? Uh, yeah, it was Indian immigrants who were Hindu. One was shot and killed, one was wounded. Yeah, and so uh, you see this guy in the parking lot trying to find his car, and you assume that he's trying to steal a car or something like that. And then what happens? Uh, and those kinds of things worry me. Uh, because well, I we, think that we're at that point. Well, I don't think you're being hysterical because if people are paying attention just in the past few days, that video went viral of the Mexican carpenter yeah, who yeah, was yeah. doing his work and the woman accosted him, used the same exact language that Trump used, mm -hmm. invading, infestation. Mm -hmm. He was very civil, had his hands like this the mm -hmm. entire time, spoke articulately, was trying to explain who he is and as was asking why she's using this language and mm -hmm. she was enraged by his presence. Mm -hmm. Now imagine if he wasn't that civil and maybe he got... Didn't use violence, but got in her face. Mm -hmm. What would happen? Mm -hmm. Right, right. But as was like, so here's the thing, right? We like we tell this like depressing thing. There's a story I like to tell because I think it's um, it's like uplifting in a particular kind of way, right? And I think it ties. We'll both uplift of these them. Things. I, I don't have right. some faith in me. We'll uplift yeah. them. But it ties these things together, yeah. right? Which is uh, that not long after 9/11, um, I was on an airplane. I was in Atlanta, going from Atlanta to New York. And I'm seated, and I'm in an aisle seat, and so I can see, I mean, I'm kind of toward the back, like two-thirds of the way back, so I can see all the way down the plane. And this tall, olive-complexioned man with a long beard, he has like a white kufi on and a uh, white tunic and baggy pants. So he gets on the, on the plane, he reads as Muslim, right? Yeah. Um, he's coming down the aisle toward me, and you can almost see the tension ratcheting up as he walks down the aisle. Yeah. And as fate would have it, he sits down across from me one row back. And so I look at him, and I look at him again, and I said, where are you from? And he very appropriately said, where are you from? <laughs> and I said, I'm from Queens. And he said, okay. And everybody's listening now, right? <laughs> Everybody's like, Listening. Jelani asked the question. Right. Vet him. Vet him for us. <laughs> vet him, right. Yeah. And, um, and I said, I'm asking because I think you're from Queens too. And he looks up. And I said, and if you are who I think you are, we were in the same breakdance crew in high school. <laughs> ah. 
and, and you freaked out the entire plane for the, the next plane, five hour flight. But everybody's like, oh my God, it's, he, he was a break dancer. He's not going to kill us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he might be a radical break dancer. Right, a like, radical break one dancer. One of the legs might like go up and like, you know, kick someone in the head. I'm so, so like we stand up and hug That's and, you know. It's a good story. Right. And so he's like, Jelani, we haven't seen each other since high school. Awesome. We're talking, we're catching up. Like all the white people exhale. Um, <laughs> And I said, like, this was a great experience for me because for once, I'm the large black man making the white people around me feel more comfortable. <laughs> so, you, you, for, you did well for the whites. But, but here's the point of that, though. Here's the point of that story, which is that because I went to a school where we had an Indian Muslim dude yeah. who was a break dancer with, like, a Puerto Rican dude, like all, but I don't even remember we all went to of an like, integrated school. We went to an integrated school. So where he was a blank slate, where we could project all these other kinds of ideas onto him. And build relationships. What I saw yeah. was a friend. That's right. An old friend who I was happy to see. And I think getting us collectively to that place, where we're not treating people as these blank slates that we can project. As villains. Right, as villains. Like automatic, the automatic presumption that we put this script on your body. Yeah. A script and an image. Right, an image and a script, yeah. The violent black man. Right. The bearded, brown, angry, bellicose, brown man who represents all things Islam, uh, who's anti-deodorant, anti-Semitic, anti-woman, <laughs> and wants to implement Sharia. No, I'm right. serious. That's right, called right, right. Rage Boy. I'm not making this term up. Called mm -hmm. Rage Boy. Google image search. Actually, let's just do this right now. Take out your phone. Google image search Rage Boy. All right? Raise your hand if you do it. Look at Google image searches. You'll see the first image I'll act for you. This is the image. That is a media term of Shaquille Ahmed Butt, a 40-year-old Kashmiri activist. That meme was used as the image to talk about Islam and Muslims for mm. years. They mm. went and talked to this meme and found out that he's a human being in Kashmir. Mm -hmm. And they said, how do you feel about being a meme? He goes, you know, it sucks, I'm you know, Kashmiri, I'm single, but whatever, let people do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. Look at the third image. If you look at the third image, just scroll right to the third image, they have another photo of Shaquille Ahmed Bhatt, Rage Boy. This is the image of him. Hello. I'm not making it up. Mm -hmm. If you raise your hand and see it, you see it. I'm not mm -hmm. making this up. I'm not mm -hmm. making this up. We're not crazy. Mm -hmm. Imagine if your entire people's narrative was framed by that image. Imagine if your entire people's narrative was framed by cops. Mm -hmm. But the reality was, hello, I'm 40 years old. I'm single. Mm -hmm. um, just to let you know that I'm not crazy. Uh, I don't want to be controversial in the last 15 minutes, so let's talk about Jordan Peterson. Um, <laughs> you and I went to Jordan Peterson yesterday. Anyone mm -hmm. attend Jordan Peterson yesterday? OK. Mm -hmm. uh, I never saw him before. I, I heard a lot about him. I did not read him. I, gave, I went with an open mind. Mm -hmm. I tweeted something, I tried to be very diplomatic, I said the following. After listening to Jordan Peterson, I understand his appeal to so many white men and women, mm -hmm. especially those who are angry and dislocated. Mm -hmm. Just my two cents, don't wanna trigger the audience. Earlier today in the morning, I was talking to a very well-known writer who is here, I will not name this writer, asked me about my thoughts on the Jordan Peterson's talk. I was a little bit more open, very civil. Um, it ended finally. I triggered something in this in this in this uh, mm -hmm, speaker. Mm -hmm. There was just there was anger, a, a reaction, um, and it ended with the speaker saying the following. Because I'll admit what I said was following. It goes. I was expecting something more. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a mediocre intellect, mm -hmm. not bad but mediocre. Uh, I didn't think the ideas were that special. I thought there was a lot of intellectual jabberwocky around mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. and I wanted someone of uh, a Jelani to talk to him. And I thought he could be able to dissect it really well. And these were my critiques. I won't get into my critiques. It ended with the following. This well-known writer said the following. Conceded. Yes, he's mid-level. He's mid-level, OK? He's a mid-level guy. He's talking about, their words, not mine, 1957 civics. It's just 1957 civics, but it's a breath of fresh air to so many of us. Your thoughts? Mm. Um, so I, 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 like you, I went with an open mind. Uh, and you know, I agreed with him on some things. His critique of academia, especially yep. the t administrative top heaviness of a lot of universities, um, 
and where money gets funneled to, like it doesn't necessarily show up in faculty salaries uh, or, or uh, in student aid. And there are these real questions about affordability of education. I agreed with 95% of what he said on that subject. And a few other points that I thought were valid. But on the issue of social hierarchies, um, particularly regarding women, uh, and you know, I really felt like I had this sentiment throughout the talk where I felt like the straw men should press charges. Yes. Because. And the straw women. And the straw women. Because it was kind of saying, but who thinks that? Like, it was like making an the argument. Radical left. Making an argument against. I was like, I've never heard that argument. It was like, I've hung out with. I was at the Occupy things. They, nobody said anything like that, you know? Um, and so there were, it was easy to knock over these positions that I think weren't widely held and in the first place. And the other thing that was really disturbing about that, because we're having this conversation about hierarchies, uh, is like I was confused about how he began this work trying to understand Mao and the millions of people uh, that Mao killed. And Nazi Germany. Nazi Germany Stalin, Fascism. what Stalin did in Ukraine, like these grand scale atrocities of the 20th century, but somehow this wound up being a defense of white male hierarchy. Uh, when, and I was like, I didn't understand how he didn't see the connection between those two things. Yeah. Uh, and so I, at the end of it, was a little bit surprised, actually. But, but I was surrounded in the first two, because uh, I was in the first two rows, the, the VIP seats. Mm -hmm. I'm not VIP, I just piggybacked on a friend. And I'm usually very civil. Um, but there were a few times when even I said, come on, man, come mm -hmm. on. And I was expecting someone to share that, and everyone mm -hmm. was nodding their head. Mm -hmm. This is upper class, educated, white mm -hmm. men and women who loved what he was saying. Mm -hmm. And then Barry, Barry Weiss pressed him on Milo. She right. said, Milo Yiannopoulos, who, by the way, yesterday said uh, vigilantes should gun down journalists. He said, do you find him racist? Ah, uh, he's a prankster. Yeah. And then she goes, no, no, but he's racist. I don't know if he's racist. Right. So people like us mm -hmm. going through this conversation, when someone like that says that, and whether or not their views or their points, whether it's not up to them whether or not, you know, how people use it and abuse it, but we know for a fact it's very influential mm -hmm. to a lot of white men and women mm -hmm. who are very threatened by women and people of color, right. how are we supposed to respond? And no, we've talked a lot about men and the anxieties of men of color in this um, conversation. I don't want to make sure that it's not excluded that these forces have been virulently uh, misogynistic as well and uh, directed their ire at, at women, at women of color. Can I, can I do a study, a stat real quick? The number one recruitment, uh, alt-right recruits from straight white college males. Mm -hmm. And people often talk about, oh, they're anti-Semitic, they're anti-Muslim, they're anti-immigrant, they're anti-black. Mm -hmm. But the core recruitment is, anyone take a guess? Anti-woman. Mm -hmm. You're being emasculated by empowered women. And we're going to give you your masculinity back. Right. Please. And that's, and that's a very um, powerful tool. Uh, it's, it's the flip side of the tool of saying that we're going to protect our women from these dark-skinned men who uh, pose a uh, sexual threat to them. I mean, those two ideas have found themselves in co close conjunction very frequently over the history of this country. And so, yeah, that was striking to me because it seemed like not thinking about the implications of what this was, that if we have a president who says the, like, it also, just as a quick aside, the pure vulgarity that we have to resort to to accurately report what he has said that the P word, which used to be way in the dark alley of unforgive of unusable Locker language. Locker room talk. Right. Now, you can hear someone say that on CNN because he has infected. I said it on Aspen, just to quote him. Yeah, on just purpose. To quote him, on right, purpose. Just to quote him. But there are all these other kinds of vulgarities that are, I think, metaphorical to the level of our societal discourse and our societal sense of who we are that have found their way into the language. And so when we see this, it's not coincidental that there's a kind of court intellectual that rationalizes that. Final eight minutes, they gave me extra five minutes, believe it or not, and I'm gonna ask two hopeful questions. You guys still with us? Yeah. All right, good. I said we should keep talking, but they're trying to kick us out. I said if Jordan <laughs> Peterson could go for an hour and 40 minutes, you can have us for an hour and 15. All right, anyway. 
We got seven minutes. I'm going to respect you. Don't worry. Seven minutes. I got out. Look, I've told you this before. I said it on email. I gave an analogy. I've been following this closely. I take white rage and anger very seriously. Mm -hmm. I'm a student of American history. You're a professor of history. Mm -hmm. The analogy I gave is the following. And I'm not talking about all white people. I'm not talking about all white people. I'm talking about a certain base. I said, if given a choice from here on out between renting a room in their house to a person of color or a woman or burning down the house, they will burn down the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I'm asking myself, am I witnessing the death rattle or death march of white supremacy? Mm -hmm. And when people say, well, Jahat, you're crazy, I say Trump. I say Viktor Orban in Hungary. Mm -hmm. I say, look at the Italian elections. I say Brexit. Mm -hmm. I say Geert Wilders in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. I say Golden Dawn Party in Greece. I say- Modi in yeah, India. Yeah. I say Modi in India. I say Ataturk. Uh, authoritarianism, and specifically in Europe, white nationalism. Mm -hmm. Some of my best friends are white folks. Mm -hmm. I love the white folks. Mm -hmm. We're in this together. We are, we are going to individually hug every white yeah. person in this room after. <laughs> yeah, at the, we will. At the conclusion. I went, I went to, an, you know how you said you were integrated uh, in Jamaica, uh -huh. I, uh, in Queens? Mm -hmm. I went to an all boys Jesuit Catholic high school where I was the only Muslim in every semester. I got the highest grade in religious studies. Oh, wow. And Father, and <laughs> Father Allender used to read out the names and his Jesuit heart just cracked a little bit. Um, <laughs> We like white people, we're friends with white people, some of us marry white people, we have kids, we have biracial kids. For the white allies in the audience, mm -hmm. what do you need from them to get us to the promised land? <clears throat> do you know what I think we need? I think that we need more than anything else for people of conscience to behave as if they are people of conscience. Because, because the things that have happened are unconscionable. And we've seen rationalization after rationalization. Supreme Court just talk, passed a Muslim ban. He promised it. But when we talk, right, when we talk about, uh, you know, Viola Liuzzo, who came to Selma in 1965, who was a housewife in Detroit and just simply saw what was happening and said, this is wrong. Like that call to conscience. And there is another tradition of populism in this country. There is the virulent, anti-black, racist version of populism. Conspiratorial, paranoid, yeah. uh, zero-sum, all of those things. There is an inclusive history of populism. This is what George Wallace represented. You know, it's what people were attempting to, to build interracial alliances in the civil rights movement to say that we see ourselves reflected in your concerns. Multicultural coalition of the willing. Yeah, exactly. I think that's what, what Reverend William Barber, who's somebody I've written about and I find very inspirational, poor people's campaign. is trying to do with the Poor People's Campaign. That I don't think that, uh, I don't leave, uh, to reiterate the final point, I don't walk around with this cloud of pessimism I don't either. about whether or not we'll prevail. I really walk around with um, a frown of concentration saying how, how will we do it, not whether we will. I'll ask a final question before I open. Jelani will be here if you want to ask some questions. And, and my request is the following. If you've heard Jelani and me talk, I think maybe you can take away that it's exhausting being a walking Wikipedia entry. <laughs> it's exhausting being civil all the mm -hmm. time. It's exhausting to defend your existence and your people's existence and your civilization. It's exhausting being indicted convicted and sentenced by a nameless judge, jury, and executioner based on a word or image they have seen about your people. Mm -hmm. And so what I ask and request is everything, even civility, is about reciprocity. Mm -hmm. And some work needs to be done, just a little bit, on the opposite side. And I speak for Jelani, and if I don't, if I'm, if you're, if I'm incorrect, tell me I'm wrong, our hands are always there, mm -hmm. willing to grasp across the aisle. Final question with two minutes left. We have babies. Mm -hmm. We love our children. Mm -hmm. You're a, a recent father. I'm kind of a recent mm -hmm. father. Our roles in life have changed. Mm -hmm. Anyone who here has kids or babies? Mm -hmm. Game changer. Mm -hmm. You're attached, you're tethered to a human being that you've brought into the world and you now are responsible for, mm -hmm. and you will kill or be killed mm -hmm. for that baby. Mm -hmm. Am I right or wrong? I always wanted to be a gardener, mm -hmm. figuratively. Mm -hmm. I wanted to plant a seed, mm -hmm. watch the tree, enjoy the mango fruit. Mm 
Mm -hmm. I want to ball out of control. I wanted to go at Aspen's. I wanted to be creme de la creme, right? I'm like, I wanted to do it. My wife and I, th and I think that my role is either two roles. Maybe I can't be a gardener. Maybe my job is to be a janitor. Mm -hmm. Clean all this shit up mm -hmm. so that my kids have a better chance. Or maybe my job, go to back to Game of Thrones reference, is Hodor. I have to just hold the door. Mm -hmm. As white nationalist hate absolutism is coming out, I just have to hold the door until my kids escape. Mm -hmm. What's our role as fathers mm -hmm. moving forward? Final question, two minutes left. Um, I mean, I'll just say this. I mean, I said it earlier that everything that I do in life for me is refracted through the lens of two parents that fled Jim Crow in the South. And that it was wildly improbable for them to believe that one, they would escape that system, but, or two, that their children would have the kinds of opportunities that I've done my best to take advantage of. And for me, everything that I do in my life is oriented toward making sure that my daughter has no less of that opportunity. And that's it. Inshallah, God willing. Jelani and, 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 I, and I will be here as your token black and Muslim friends. We're giving out hugs. Thank you, Belly Up. Thank you, Aspen. And thanks for giving us the extra five minutes. Take care.